So in part two of our notes on extending classical conditioning, I've got just a couple more people, more names to introduce you to and a couple more concepts, ideas to wrap your mind around. So extending Pavlov's understanding. We talked about Watson, um, but we want to talk more specifically about classical conditioning. So Pavlov and Watson considered consciousness or the mind not fit for scientific study of psychology, which we kind of talked about with Watson. Like, it's nothing, like, these cognitive processes and all that stuff, no. They totally underestimated the cognitive processes and the biological constraints upon learning. Okay, so that's kind of their, their fault, right? Like, like, that's kind of their flaw, is that they underestimate those. So if you're ever asked a question about what did behaviorists like Pavlov and Watson underestimate, it's cognition, the mental processes, and biological constraints upon learning. And those will be what we, what we talk about from here on out. So early behaviorists believe that behaviors of various animals could be reduced to mindless mechanisms. And let's talk about what that means, mindless mechanisms. What that's saying is that with Pavlov's dogs, they were simply salivating to the bell. They were not thinking about it. They were essentially becoming mindless robots that responded to the bell. In comes Robert Rascorla. You should highlight, underline, engrave his name in your brain. Robert Rascorla believed that this was basically correct, but the idea was too limited. So he came up with what we call the contingency model of classical conditioning. What he's doing, and I want you to write this down, what Rascorla is doing is adding cognition to classical conditioning. He's saying it's not really a mindless mechanism. We are not just mindless mechanisms. Yes, we're making the association, but we're thinking about the association that we have made. So the contingency model says that A is contingent upon B, or A depends upon B and vice versa. Well, what's all this A and B talk? Like, well, what does that mean? In other words, the presence of the conditioned stimulus or the neutral stimulus like the bell has to predict the presence of the UCS or else there will not be a response. So I'll, I'll repeat that. The conditioned stimulus, the neutral stimulus, must predict the unconditioned stimulus. So the dog would say to themselves, well, the last time he rang that bell, the neutral stimulus, he gave me food, the unconditioned stimulus, which then causes the dog to salivate. So learning occurs in situations where the relationship between the CS and UCS is clear and predictable, meaning it is expected. So the dog expects the food to come, therefore they salivate. This makes sense for me personally because I feel like it explains why extinction eventually happens, right? Like the dog eventually is thinking to themselves, well, you haven't given me food in a while, so I'm not salivating because I don't need to. Like it's, I'm not thinking of food anymore because you've been ringing that bell and not presenting food. And with little Albert, right? Like, oh, I'm seeing this white furry mouse. I'm not gonna respond with fear anymore because you've been ringing that really loud, scary gong noise. But Watson and Rainer strengthened the association by ringing it every few days, right? So again, kind of reminding them of it and strengthening the association. So let's think of an example, okay, with the contingency model. So for three days straight, whenever the phone rings in AP psychology class, it's for you and you are called to, let's say, the principal's office. The next day when the phone rings in AP psych, okay, so just a reminder, for three straight days, you're sitting in your like fourth bell class, the phone rings, it's the teacher answers and they say, please send Johnny to the principal's office you get up and you go all three days. The next day the phone rings in AP Psychology and you think, oh, here we go. So you get out of your seat and begin to head out the door because you assume the phone call is for you to go to the principal's office. Now, here's the thing. We gotta talk about why, but let's talk about why not. You are not just a mindless mechanism that hears the phone ring and stands up, right? Like you are not a mindless mechanism. I don't know about you, but a phone ringing itself does not make me stand up. 
I think to myself, ooh, the phone is ringing, and for the past few days, it's been for me. So I'm going to go to where I, they are probably calling me to. So again, let's talk about the why. Because A, the phone ringing, is contingent upon B, you being called to the office. Because whenever A, the phone rings, B, you being called to the office, occurs. The last three days, every time the neutral stimulus of the phone has happened, the unconditioned stimulus of you being called to the office has happened. Therefore, you just think to yourself, and that's the cognitive part, it's got to be for me, it has been for the last three days, so I'm going. That is the exact same thing as the dog thinking, the last few times he's rang that bell, he's given me food. Oh boy, I'm going to salivate. It's the same exact thing. So all risk Orla is doing is adding cognition. So let's change the situation slightly to kind of show you how um, it, this wouldn't work. First, um, let's say the same three days whenever the phone rings in class, a different student is called to the counselor's office or the attendant's office. The last call was for you. Okay, so on the last day of the three days, it was for you. So on the fourth day, the phone rings. What would you assume? you would assume nothing. Why? Because there's not a strong connection between the phone ringing and it being you that's being called to the office. One event is not going to predict the other. So our reactions are not just knee-jerk reactions. They're not just, we're not just mindless mechanisms, but it's based on our expectations of what will happen. It's been happening, so I am expecting it to happen this time. And you have to set up that, that process. Some other cognitive influences, not necessarily classical conditioning, but it does show the idea that learning is not just a mindless function, but it includes cognitive functions, okay? So insight learning, a vocabulary term, and we're gonna give you another name to remember here. Insight learning is a form of cognitive learning in which problem solving occurs by means of sudden reorganization of perceptions. That's kind of complex, so let me talk about it a little bit more, and you can clarify your understanding in your notes. Kohler, like Kohl's, the store with an ER, Wolfgang Kohler, he found chimps, right? He used chimps in his experiment. He found that chimps could solve complex problems by combining simpler behaviors they had previously learned separately. So one chimp, Sultan was his name, learned to pile boxes or use a stick to get dangling bananas. When Kohler hung the bananas really high up in the air, Sultan combined the two skills, stacking the box and using the stick to reach the food. He was never taught them in combination. So with Sultan the chimp, it was kind of like a light bulb going off, which is kind of what insight learning is. It's like, ding, well, what if I combine me stacking these boxes and using the stick, then I can get the banana. It's insight learning. So biological influences on learning. Animals and humans are biologically prepared to make certain connections more easily than others, meaning they're born this way. Genetically, they are going to make this connection because these connections help keep us alive. So it's both biological as well as an evolutionary perspective here. So associating strange tastes with feelings of illness or avoiding a food after it has made us ill have helped us survive as a species, right? If I'm like nomadic, I don't know, I'm gonna use the word caveman, that's not really nice anymore, politically correct, I guess. Um, early homo sapien or something like that, right? And I come upon a bush of berries and I eat those berries and they make me deathly ill, guess what? I'm not gonna eat those berries anymore. I've learned my lesson. That gives me a biological, or not even a biological, it gives me an advantage, right? So taste aversions seem to be biologically programmed into humans and some animals to help them understand, you really shouldn't eat that again because it's bad for you. And hence won't kill you and you'll survive more and you'll spread your gene pool. One last vocabulary term that I wanna talk about you with, and I don't have anything on the screen here because I'm kind of doing this rather impromptu and I wanna make sure that you get it. Um, latent learning. So again, there's not gonna be anything on the screen. I just need you to listen to me, okay? Think about um, latent from 
unit five with the psychoanalysis perspective on why we dream, right? So when Freud said we have a manifest content and we have a latent content. Manifest content being what actually happened, the storyline of your dream. The latent content being the hidden, underlying, revealing your unconscious mind um, interpretation of what the dream means. So latent means hidden, okay? So again, here then, if we apply the meaning of the word latent, means hidden learning. And what I want you to write down is that the technical definition being that latent learning is learning that is not obvious or apparent, being another word, not obvious until a reinforcement is given. So what we've learned from latent learning is that we don't have to have a reinforcement in order to learn. And the way that they found this out in their research was they um, had a maze for these mice, okay? And they allowed a few mice, they closed off all the entrances and exits, okay? So there was really no getting to the end. There was no like cheese at the end. There was no reinforcement. And they put mice in the maze to just kind of wander. All the mice were doing was wandering in the maze, okay? They take those mice out and they open an entrance and an exit and they put some cheese, a reinforcement at the end. They take a mouse that was not wandering in the maze first and make him go through the maze, they time him. Then they take a mouse who was able to wander in the maze previously and let him go through, get the reinforcement, and timed him. The mice who were able to wander the maze previously had significantly faster times in getting through the maze, meaning they were able to learn about the maze upon their wandering, even though they were not reinforced to do so. Latent learning. Okay, so it was not obvious or apparent that they learned about the maze until a reinforcement of cheese was given. Let me give you a real life example. So you have been in a car more days than not in your life, right? Whether or not you were driving them. Think about it, three days after you were born approximately, you came home from the hospital in a car. You have been in a car your entire life, even though you probably have not been driving longer than not in a car, right? So here's the idea. When you sat down when you were 15 or 16 years old with your temps and mom or dad are teaching you how to drive, you sit down in the driver's seat. Did you go, uh, mom, what's this circular thing like in front of me and what do I do with it? You probably did not have to ask that question. You also probably, hopefully, didn't have to ask the question about like the, um, the gear shifter thingy of getting from reverse and park and drive, right? Maybe you had to like realize, okay, what's the P, N, and R, and D mean? <laughs> but um, you understood the idea of the gear shifter, right? Um, here's the thing. The fact that you understood that was not apparent until a reinforcement like your attempts or earning your license one day was given. That's latent learning.